Well, good morning. My name is Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Communion Hanover, and we're glad you could be with us in person. And welcome to those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. Father, you've given every good gift to us and uh, shared the very love and life that's existed between you and your Son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit from all eternity, before anything existed, Lord. And we're grateful for that. So, Holy Spirit, um, we, we desperately want to know uh, Jesus with his Father the way we are known by them, and we desperately want to believe what Jesus believes about us and about his Father. So teach us, tutor us. Uh, we give ourselves um, to this intimacy today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, the, the title, you, you may recognize, and, and some of you may have observed, that it's a little bit flipped from, from the movies, uh, The Three Musketeers, or the book. And, um, you know, The Three Musketeers would say, um, all for one, one for all. But that's not the order that the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Corinthians, so I switched it and uh, wanted you to know that um, in case you were tempted to, to uh, call me out and say that it's backwards. Uh, I already know it's backwards, but it fits who I am a lot more. If you get to know me, you'll, you'll understand that. So today, I wanted to talk, um, I wanted to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in the ministry of reconciliation that the Apostle Paul says Jesus has given to us. One of the things to understand, one of the things that's important to know when you're reading Paul is that Paul was an educated man. He was educated in the art of rhetoric. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of devices that, that Paul used in his teaching style. And uh, the, the Socratic method can be found there where, where when, when you can ask enough questions, leading questions, so that a person is led to discover the answer for themselves. I mean, we've got two school teachers in the room with us today, and they'll tell you that if, if you can coax a student into coming up with the right answer on their own, it sticks a lot longer. We, we, when we come up with the answer, uh, the right answer, um, with a little guidance on our own, it stays with us longer, right? Um, that's what learning is. In fact, education comes from a Greek word, educaro. And, ed and educaro literally means to draw out from within, right? You have, you have the ability to know things and to reason. God's given you an intellect, and the process of education is to draw that out, right? So, we need to understand what Paul is doing. One of the tools that Paul uses is um, in, in his rhetoric is to use um, a rhetorical statement. He'll say, if you are. But he doesn't, mean, he, he doesn't mean it in such a way as to invite you to something. He's using it rhetorically. And so maybe to help you understand, you can substitute the word since, right? Like your, your, um, your, your mother may say or your father may say, if you're a high school graduate, you should get a job. Well, it doesn't, I mean, if, if, if your father or mother is talking to a high school graduate, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't mean you should graduate from high school because you've already graduated from high school. Basically what's being communicated is, all right, since you've graduated from high school, you need to get a job a summer job, you know, go to school, whatever you're going to do. It's time to, it's time to move on from high school. So this is the, 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 um, the, the teaching tool that Paul uses. I'm going to begin reading in verse, oh, before that, I forgot to tell you about Rally Point. We have to pause. Can I have the Rally Point slide? So Monday...
All right, let's move on to our scripture. I'm going to begin reading in um, verse 11, and uh, you'll pick it up on your screens um, at verse 14. But if you have your Bible, it doesn't matter. You can read along anyway. So in the pericope heading in my Bible, which is the New Revised Standard Version, um, the heading that's added by the translators is the ministry of reconciliation. All right, so you know that Paul is going to be talking about our ministry. So everything that we're reading today comes into the context of our ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so you gotta you got to ask yourself some questions. Right, if you have something, where did it come from? Right, that, that's a valid question. If I, if I have water, where did my water come from? Well, it came out of a bottle. Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from Deer Park. Well, where did that? You can, you can go all the way back, right, until you get to the point where, well, I guess Jesus made the water. So if, if I have a ministry of reconciliation and I ask the question, where did that come from? Hold tight. Paul's going to answer it. So in verse 11, Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, and this is not, a, this is not an irrational um, phobia, even though the Greek word is phobos, it doesn't mean afraid. It's a, it's a term that indicates reverence, right? So knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God. Well, how about that? We are well known to God. Right, I think I um, mentioned earlier um, this month the conversation I had with the Lord about whether or not He trusts me, and it, it came as an accusation. I had this, I had this thought, this question came in my mind during a during a book study I was involved in, and um, I, I knew it was not just a question, a benign question. I knew it was an accusation because immediately my memory was flooded with tons of bad things I had done in my life. Right. And the question was not, does God trust you? It, it was sort of, does God trust you? And so I re recognizing that this came from the evil one, Ophus, we like to say, right? Because uh, Ophus sounds a lot like doofus, and Ophus is the word for serpent in Greek, right? So we can say Ophus. So I knew it came from Ophus. And so I prayed, and I asked God the Father specifically, do you trust me? And the answer came immediately, and the answer was no. I don't trust you. I've never trusted you. I know you. And that was huge for me. See, God doesn't have to trust me because he knows me. If I say I trust someone, it's, it means I don't know. I have to trust them. God doesn't have to trust me. He knows me. And then I thought about this. Well, if... If God created me to know him and be known by him, will I always have to trust God? Yeah. Because, you see, I have a finite mind, and it's not possible for me to ever fully know an infinite God. But I suspect that my need to trust God will diminish proportionate to my knowing. As I come to know him in eternity, I will have less need to trust him. And I don't know if those, if those lines ever begin to intersect or if they're always parallel. I have no idea. I don't need to know all that stuff. So this persuasion of others, and be, it, it comes out of Paul's being well known to God, right? Paul wants you to know what he knows. And the only thing that Paul knows is that he's well known to God. God knows me, and he's bringing me to know himself, and so I want to tell you what I've learned about him. Well, isn't that what being a believer is all about? Let me, let me tell you what I've learned about the goodness of God. Let me tell you what I've learned about how he loves me. Let me tell you about this stupid thing I did in my life, and I thought everything was over with, and God pulled me out and redeemed me. That's what it means to be a believer. And he says, uh, we're well known to, I'm well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearances and not in the heart. So rather than waiving your offering 
you know, for everybody to see. We're supposed to be boasting about what Jesus has done in our life, not what we have done, right? We're supposed to be boasting about what Jesus has done in our life. So, if we are beside ourselves, and, and your translation may say, if we're out of our minds, which is literally what it means, if we seem crazy to you, right? If we are out of our minds, it is for God. And if we're in our right mind, it's for you. So, what Paul is basically saying here is, this looks crazy. It looks absolutely crazy. Do you know there's only one belief system in the world that doesn't teach that you are supposed to give your life for your God? Either, either metaphorically or literally. There's only one belief system in the world that teaches that your God gave his life for you, and that's Christianity. The gospel doesn't say you have to die for Jesus. The gospel tells you that Jesus died for you. And we'll read that further as we go. So, it looks crazy. It looks absolutely crazy. When you tell people, the worst person you can think of, God loves them unconditionally. It's hard for us to believe. In fact, I was doing a Bible study one time at a, in another city at another church. I was helping out while they were searching for a pastor. And this lady came up to me. I'd been teaching in this Bible study that, that God loves us all unconditionally and equally. And she wanted me to assure her as a pastor that right, that right now, at this very minute, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, and her brother-in-law were suffering in the flames of hell. And, you know, two things came to mind. One was, this is a, this is a horrible way of thinking. And secondly, man, her brother-in-law must have been a real bad guy to get lumped in with Stalin. Now, I don't know if you know, but Stalin killed way more people than Hitler ever did. I mean, Stalin makes Hitler look like an amateur. And don't even start on Chairman Mao in terms of numbers. But if you get lumped in with those kind of people, you must have done something really bad. So in any case, it scandalizes us, doesn't it? It doesn't make sense. People would say, you're out of your mind. You're, you mean God loved Joseph Stalin unconditionally in spite of all that he did? Yep. And all these other, whoever you can name, God loved them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely did. Doesn't mean that he approved of what they did, but loved them nonetheless. And so then, this is where you'll pick it up on your screens in verse 14. Paul says, the love of Christ urges us on. Suneko is the word for urges. And it means compels, moves to action. The love of Christ, not the law, not our own righteousness. It's the love of Christ, not our love for Christ. It's the love of Jesus Christ that's being shared with the apostles that urged them on. Because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but in him who died and was raised for them. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the measure of reconciliation, to, the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a, I was about to say a boxcar full of gospel good news, but it's probably more like a hundred car freight train full of gospel good news. There is so much there. So we'll, we'll, I want to go back to verse 16. Um, or let's go back to verse 14. And let's just take it a little at a time. One died for all, therefore all died. How is that possible? Short answer, Jesus is the vicarious human being. He took you into himself. Well, I wasn't born yet. Doesn't matter. If you need a theological way to talk about that, it's called prolepsis. It means that whatever Jesus accomplished implicates and affects every single human being, past, present, and future. And, and how does that work? I don't know. Jesus is the vicarious man. He is also God in flesh. He never ceases to be God with God, true light from true light, as the creed says, homo siasto patre, of the same essence as the Father. He never ceases to be God, but yet joins himself to our humanity. So if an eternal being joins himself to humanity, what does that make humanity? It includes humanity in that eternity. So if you need a way to think about this, think about time and space. As T.F. Torrance taught over and over again, you cannot think about time without thinking about space. There's only space-time. Where you are, this this place that you occupy is connected to time and your, and your time in it. And so when Jesus occupies our space, he is bringing his time with it. Or a better way to say it is his timelessness into it. That's the mechanics of eternal life. How does that work? How do I, how do I live forever? How, do, how is it my body never wears out like it does right now? Well, how does the glorified body work? All I can say is that you have been united to the timeless one. You have been brought into objective union with the, with the eternal son of the father who is outside of time. So in this, in this thing that Jesus accomplishes, in, in, his, in his dying for one, once for all, it's just a simple matter of Jesus taking humanity into himself, past, present, and future humanity into himself. And if, if you are in Jesus, in union with Jesus, and he dies, then guess what? You die too. And the good news is, if you're, if you're in union with Jesus, if you've been brought into Jesus, what happens when he comes out in resurrection? Peter would write in his epistle, in 1 Peter 3, verse 1, he says, we've been given a new birth. We've been born again. Hallelujah, brother. One of my favorite questions when I'd go to these uh, um, ministerial breakfasts. You know, you're sitting at a table and you're meeting all these people for the first time. One of the questions that they would usually ask is, when were you, when were you born again, brother Wynn? And, and I used to just tell them the day I was baptized, you know, or something. You know, like exactly when was I born again? I you know. Give you a date. Well, I know the date now, roughly. You want to know when I was born again? It was somewhere around 30 AD. Because Peter says that we are born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the vicarious man. He's the vicarious human being. When he comes out of the grave, I came out with him. And when he ascended to his father, guess what else? So did you. So did you. You are, as the apostle says, seated with him in heavenly places. So in verse 16, he says, so from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. So don't, don't look at your neighbor simply as a creature. Homo sapien sapien. Just another primate, an advanced primate. Your neighbor, your co-worker, all these people around the world, seven and a half billion of them, are created in the image of God and brought into union with Jesus Christ. Taken down in his death, brought out in his resurrection, and raised in his ascension. How could you ever look at those people and dehumanize them? Or just look at them from some academic or evolutionary point of view? 
Paul says, no, we don't look at them like that anymore. And he says, in fact, we once, we once knew Christ from a human point of view, and we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. And this is rhetorical language. If anyone is in Christ, it's Paul himself. If, if we think Paul means here that we got to somehow find our way in so we can be a new creation. I got to get saved. I got to, I got to say a, a prayer, a sinner's prayer that's not anywhere found in the Bible. I've got to repeat some mantra so I can get in Jesus. Well, it's Paul, the same guy who told the pagans at the Arapagus in Athens, it's in Jesus that you live and move and have your being. He even quotes their own pagan poets. He says, even your own poets were right when they said we're his offspring. Paul knows you're in Christ. He's not saying if you can get in. He says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And then he's going to tell you what to do about that. So that's the beauty of the way Paul writes. Paul tells you what is, and then he tells you what to do about it. He gives you the, the indicative, and then he gives you the imperative. And the one is no less important than the other. When Paul tells you what the facts are, those are important. And sometimes we get it backwards. We get the imperatives. We, we give them greater weight than the indicatives. We Oh yeah, this is the truth. Jesus died for us. But it all hinges on what I do next. If I don't get baptized or if I don't say this prayer, it doesn't mean anything. We've diminished the ministry of Jesus. But then if we say the opposite, well, Jesus died for me. I can do whatever I want. I can hate my neighbor. I can steal his lawnmower. I burn his house down. And Jesus still loves me all the same. Guess what? Jesus does still love you all the same, but you are wrecking not only your own life, and you are, you are ruining the potential for you to share in the life that the Father, Son, and Spirit have shared from all eternity, and you may even wind up so lost in your own darkness through that behavior that you wind up standing outside with the older brother. In this self-referential, incoherent existence where there you stand beside God the Father for all eternity who loves you and sings his love song over you and yet refusing to believe the truth of that and enter into the celebration like the older brother. That's not what you want. The facts about the gospel and what we do about it bear the same freight. One will never change. You can never not believe the gospel so much that you undo what Jesus did. But you will never experience the true life that is the only life in the cosmos, the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, unless you participate, unless you surrender yourself to the will of God. And he says, and all this is from God. This is how you know this whole new creation thing in you. He says it's, it's all from God because I think Paul smells what we're standing in most of the time in our legalism. And, and, you know, I don't mean to be crude, but it's Paul himself that said, hey, all of our righteousness is just dung. The Greek word is skubala. Go look it up. It's got a really funny definition. I think you'd enjoy it. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So, a couple of things here. This whole idea that Jesus was abandoned by his Father on the cross is a lie. It's not true. Where was God the Father? you got to understand, when Paul writes distinctively about God and Jesus, when he says God, he's referring to God the Father. Right, Because Paul knows that Jesus is God with God. right? So he's distinguishing God the Father from Jesus Christ. And he says, God the Father was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world. So where was God the Father when Jesus was on the cross? Was he somewhere in the corner going, I can't look, can't look, can't look, not listening. This is terrible. Can't, can't bear to watch. Don't want to have anything to do with all this sin. No, Paul says, that the Father was in Jesus. What did Jesus say in John 14, 20? We read it last week. Someday you'll know, right? 
I am in my Father, and you are me, and I am in you. Jesus Christ and God the Father mutually indwell one another. You can't pull that apart. So in, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's good news. It is for me. I don't know if you've got any past trespasses. Maybe some trespasses you're planning on in the near future. Or if you're like the mo like most of us, just stuff that you find yourself stumbling into, and you go, "Gosh, I wouldn't. I, I wish I hadn't done that. Wish I hadn't said that." It says that God the Father was re reconciling the world, the cosmos, to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. See, Karl Barth had this great axiom, and it goes like this. The God who is will not be so without us, or he would say without you. And it just means that God's doing stuff all the time. You see, the Trinity is not mechanistic or static. The, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in this life of, of love and relationship and mutual other-centeredness other are dynamic. They're, they're doing stuff all the time, and, and they will not do it without you. Right? Sometimes we're praying, well, God, why don't you do something about this? And God's answer is, well, I've created you. And clearly, you understand my burden for this problem because you're praying to me about it. So go, let's go do something together about it. I mean, just look at children. God made the first people out of dirt, picked up dirt, blew on it, and made people. That's, that's pretty good. I remember having a, a discussion with, with um, an office mate of mine about um, this dolly, the sheep. They cloned this sheep. And he's like, well, what does that do to your religion? They made a sheep. I said, actually, they didn't. They cloned a sheep from sheep parts that God had already made. I said, so when a scientist picks up some dirt and blows on it and makes a sheep, I'll be impressed. But first, your scientist has to make his own dirt out of nothing. Then I'll be impressed, genuinely. I, I would be impressed. So what I'm getting at, God did not need your parents to create you. Could he not have picked up another handful of dirt, breathed the breath of life into it, and given you a name? but he will not be who he is without us. So God created a process by which human beings come into the world. He doesn't, need, he doesn't need you to feed a homeless person. If he could make manna rain out of the sky for Israel, well, he could feed a homeless person, but he, he doesn't want to do it without us. I mean, Jesus reiterates this and says, even if I have to raise up rocks, I'm not doing it alone. So, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're image bearers of God who have been given the ministry of reconciliation to be ambassadors for Christ. You're not an ambassador for where you work. You're not an ambassador. Now, in, a, in, a, in one sense, maybe you are in a, in, a, in, a, in a practical role. But if we're going to use the capital A, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, again, this is classic. Karl Barth calls out of Scripture this axiom that God will not be so without us. Paul, he gets this, this, this whole concept from the Apostle Paul. Um, God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you, Paul says, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, this is classic Paul. Paul tells us that we're reconciled. This is 
This is how you can be and not be at the same time in the mind of Paul the Apostle. Paul tells us that we're reconciled. That God is reconciling the world to himself. If this is true, if in the cross of Jesus, God the Father was reconciling the world to himself, well, then the world is reconciled to God, right? Been reconciled to God. God took care of that. That's, that's a fact. And then Paul says, so be reconciled. Well, does, what does that mean? Am I reconciled or not, Paul? And I'll, I'll wager that if, if what's written here is, is exactly the way Paul wrote it, I'll bet you the Corinthian church had some questions. Well, are we reconciled or not? Yes, you are reconciled. Paul did not say, therefore, become reconciled. He said, be reconciled. Paul says, you are reconciled. And you're so reconciled to God that God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. Not to get people reconciled, but to proclaim this reconciliation. So when Paul says, therefore, be reconciled, he's not saying become. He's saying go be in your reconciliation. Right? Like, like if I said, um, and I've used this example before. If I said, hey, I'm, 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 um, I'm weary, I'm tired of being a husband and a father, and I think I'm going to move back to Montana and just hunt and fish the rest of my life. Well, I hope that there are people in this room that would come up to me and say something like, Bill, you need to be a man. And stick around. You can't abandon your family like that. What are they telling me to do? Well, you've you got to lower your voice. You need to get a Y chromosome if you can find one. Um, you, you know, maybe there's a shot for that. I don't know. And, uh, you know, here's all that you've got to do to be... No, they're saying not become a man. Be what you are. Paul's not telling you to become reconciled. He's saying be what you are. And so this takes you back. This takes you back. When Paul says one died for all, one for all. Jesus did all of this for us, for everybody. And then what does he say? Let me go back and read it. So that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. So one for all. Jesus for all of us and all for one means all of us should be for Jesus. All of us should be for Jesus. And I don't want that to sound religious or some performance-based expectation that God has for us. It just means jump in the sandbox with Jesus and see what he's doing. Because I guarantee you, he's got a part for you to play. I guarantee you there's a role that Jesus has for you in somebody's life. Uh, this, this past week, I had a pickup truckload of just junk that we had cleaned up uh, around the house or that I had. And so I went to the dump, and when I got to the dump, there was this um, this white SUV blocking one of the, all the parking spaces in front of this one dumpster. And the trailer was in there, cattywampus, and just, it was a mess. And there were these two ladies trying to, as fast as they could, unload all this junk out of this U-Haul trailer. and um, I had to go around to the place where you throw away metal. It's a different spot. So I had a couple of, I think, an old exercise bike or something we'd thrown away. And so I throw that in the metal bin, and when I'm going back over to get back in line to wait for a spot to dump the regular household trash, I noticed that on the other side of this, this jackknifed trailer and SUV combination, there's an empty space. So I just backed into there and started unloading my stuff, and the lady was so apologetic. I'm so sorry. She said, I'm so sorry. I know I, I messed up and I've got all this stuff in the way and I'm so sorry. And I'm like, she said, it was, it was, she says, my first time ever trying to back up a trailer. 
She had rented this U-Haul trailer, and I said, well, I th she had it in there. She was able to unlock I said, I think you did pretty good for the first time. Back in a trailer is really hard. I think you're doing great. Most people wouldn't have the courage to show up at a public dump the first time they had to back a trailer. So what I'm, what I'm saying is Jesus will put you in situations and places where you can be an encourager. He'll put you in places where you can bail somebody out of a bad situation. I'm out of gas. Or I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. And if somebody doesn't follow Jesus into this moment, I'm going to be at the end of a rope. Jesus will not be who he is without us. And, and if I take anything away from this passage today, it's this. Open your eyes. Live your life with your eyes open to what Jesus is already doing around you. And maybe every morning you can start your day or include in your morning prayer, Lord, whatever you're doing today, I want in. I, I want to be a part of that. I want in. I'm in. I'm yours today. And see what that does. And be, be warned, this is going to make the evil one, this is make Ophis pretty mad with you. And there will be other opportunities that will present themselves to, to get angry, to get impatient. You know, one thing that helps me with my impatience is to remember that I'm going to live forever. What's five more minutes? I've got eternity. I've got eternity. If it takes me an extra five minutes at the dump, so what? But that one angry look, that one angry word that we might speak to someone in that moment may be just enough to partner with Ophus instead of Jesus. And I am not going to live my life in partnership with the evil one. Years ago, I was counseling with a young couple, not in this church. And, and they were having some trouble. And one of the things that the, the husband was doing was, was demeaning the wife constantly, putting her down, putting her down, making her feel small. And um, I sat down, and I'm, I'm counseling with them, and in, in, in the just first five minutes where I'm trying to introduce myself, get to know them. He, he did it about three or four times right in front of me. And she's sitting on the floor with a toddler trying to keep the, that was an infant, trying to keep the infant satisfied and placated so we can have this counseling session. And he's, he's doing it right in front of me. And so I said this. I said, I feel welcome in your home. Thank you for inviting me in. I'm glad you invited me here. I said, but uh, let's, let's just say for the sake of argument that you did not invite me into your home tonight, but instead I broke the door down. You don't know who I am. I wasn't invited, but I'm going to break the door down. And when I, when, I, I, when, I, when I break the door down, I'm going to start trying to destroy your wife. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to kick your butt. And I said, good. That's the right answer. It's what you should do. I said, let me tell you something that you obviously don't know. From the day your wife was born, the evil one has been trying to destroy her. So if I break in your door and try to destroy your wife, you mean you're not going to join in and try to help me? Well, no. I said, the evil one's been trying to destroy your wife since the day she was born. Why are you helping? And he just began to weep. I, don't partner with the evil one. If you're about to say or do something and you can't say that this behavior that's about to come out of me is going on in the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then you probably shouldn't do it. You have been reconciled. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of division, not the ministry of promoting self, not the, not, not the ministry of, of dividing separating. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation, so let's be reconcilers. I struggle with this just as much as anybody else. If you didn't know, half the time when preachers are preaching, they're talking to themselves. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus is the one for all. 
Let us all be the one for him. Let's have a, a prayer as we introduce the, uh, the Eucharist today. Father, we, we want to partner with Jesus in whatever it is that Jesus is doing. And that's scary sometimes, Lord, because you do some scary stuff. And when we follow you, sometimes it, it looks very stormy and the waves look frightening. But you are the one who commands the wind and the waves. You are the one who saves. Let us be your agents in reconciling hate. Let us be your agents in reconciling fear. Let us be your ambassadors in reconciling mythologies about you. God, we want to we want to share what we know about you with others. We want to we want to share with single mothers that you are our God, our provider. We want to share with those who are afraid that you are our strength, our tower our place of refuge. God, we want to share with those who are lonely that they've never truly ever been alone, that they live and move and have their being in Jesus. Lord, we want to be a friend of sinners. God, help us have enough sinners in our life. As we take the, the elements of communion, as we take the, the body of Jesus and his blood, let us remember the beauty of this metaphor of taking Christ into ourselves as he has taken us into himself. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to the table. If you have your elements, at home, and if you'd like to um, support what we're doing here at um, Grace Communion Hanover, you can visit our website um, at gchanover.org. You can text a gift also to 804-409-0445. Uh, we do appreciate it. You can also, you know, um, get an envelope in the back and uh, fill that out as well. The, um, the gospel is good news. I know I'm a little long today, but um, sometimes you get carried away talking about the good things, right? And the gospel is one of those good things. It's the good thing. And if you, if you remember uh, to do so, please, please keep... Um, um, John Brockmeyer and uh, Rally Point in your prayers that this group will um, grow and thrive and be a place over the summer where high schoolers in the area can uh, stay connected with one another and maybe find out a little bit more about Jesus. So we take the, the body of Jesus. And the blood of our reconciliation. We'll bless you, each one, and we'll see you again next Sunday.